So now let's address some questions with the panel. For Dr. Mehta, how is it different to read a volume rad image versus a standard radiograph? I know you touched upon this a little bit, but maybe you can expound a little bit more. Thanks. Uh, I think that's a, a really great question because I, I think people worry about, you know, being able to interpret these images. Uh, just like, you know, in residency and, and fellowship and, and practice, I'll, I'll wander over to the MSK radiology room to review an MRI or, or go over an MRI. I have found that, you know, over time you start to learn some of the the imaging, some of the signs and some of the, the things, at least for basic basic things. And, you know, with ultrasound, uh, I mentioned it earlier, I, I can't, uh, I don't have the bandwidth to understand what I'm looking at. You know, and so one of the concerns is when you start to introduce a new technology, a new imaging technology, you know, where is it going to fall on that spectrum? Uh, the beauty of volume rad is it, it's really like looking at an x-ray. Uh, it's just multiple x-rays stacked on top of each other. And I think that's the part that you have to get used to. Uh, what I've described to patients uh, as to why we're getting it, uh, or I've described to my residents, which who will often look at it over my shoulder, who universally think it's very, very cool, by the way, um, is we're looking at a hologram. You know, we're looking at this image that you can go back and forth in, like slices of cheese or uh, bending a, a, one of those holograms you used to get out of Cracker Jack boxes, and you can see different things depending on how you bend it or, or which layer you're in. And that does take some getting used to. The interesting thing is that you you have to reaccommodate and realize that you're not going to see a lot of noise or artifact from the metal if you're not in the layer of the metal and you can get more bony detail. And the other thing that surprises me about it is the level of detail that I'm seeing. And I'm, and when I go back to standard radiographs, I'm like, oh God, these are these are blurry. I mean, they're not blurry, but you know what I mean? You're not seeing that... Um, that level of quality of detail depending on what layer you're in. So, um, but I would tell you that it's really not that different. You just have to scroll through the images, uh, and once you've seen a few, it, it sort of comes and it's it's actually easier than looking at a CT because the CT is an axial or coronal or sagittal cut, uh, and you have to kind of reorient those different images together to kind of create that image in your mind of of what you're looking at. The Volume rad is is an X-ray. I mean, it's basically an X-ray that you're looking at, and it just it's the it's the layer of the X-ray that that is really that that makes the difference. Once you have the implementation uh, in your practice, you you've done it as a, a point of care system, something that you can easily integrate into your uh, current workflow or existing radiography rooms. How do you uh, look at or measure the the cost effectiveness or return on investment uh, for this type of technology? Well, for me, this is um, really the critical question of this whole thing. When is it, what is the return on investment clinically, economically, uh, in terms of society, in terms of uh, time management? Uh, the returns on investment for this modality, in my mind, across all of these various um, axes is, is very high. It doesn't take uh, much back of the napkin uh, arithmetic to realize that even at, at, at very conservative rates of usage uh, for a typical um, practice um, or individual, but really more, more, more likely a practice, um, at very conservative uh, reimbursement rates, that the return on investment as to when one would get um, payoff, so to speak, the software upgrade, it's a very short period of time. But that's just a, a relatively um, small part of it. There are serious returns on investment for workflow uh, within the office. And uh, it's more than just saving the patient the time that it takes to go get a CT scan somewhere and then to have to come back. And then there's another copay, and you've, you're, you're, you're losing um, three days' worth of time or maybe a week and a half worth of time if you have to get uh, prior approval for the CT scan and the the, the time that your staff spends trying to get that approval from an insurance company. It's, volume rad is, is here and now, and as I just said, takes 11 to 15 minutes to do, as opposed to a CT scan, which uh, uh, costs a factor of 10 more uh, to A, uh, buy the equipment to acquire the study, and B, uh, some carrier to reimburse the study. Um, but it's the entire uh, flow of the patient through the office. And most of the patients in whom we use this modality uh, get a plain film first, 
And then, as Dr. Maida said, there's not you, you, you have a question in your mind. There's enough uncertainty that we send them send the patient back for a very specific study. And what's interesting is when one looks at that study and it answers the question one was hoping it would answer, when one goes back to the plain film, um, you're, you have a you, you can yes it's quote blurrier as Dr. Maida said, but in another sense it's actually uh, more obvious. Um, so you're, we're saving the doctor time, we're saving the patient time, we're getting to the uh, diagnoses more uh, more quickly, more effectively. Um, I would say about, um, and I'm just pulling numbers out of the air, uh, probably uh, digital tomosynthesis supplants well more than half of CT scans that I would otherwise consider. And then there's a larger issue that also has economics behind it, and that is the issue of um, this day of transitioning uh, from fee-for-service to um, uh, value-based uh, reimbursement. That is, uh, digital tomosynthesis will have as its strongest proponents, beyond those trying to minimize the radiation dose, especially in certain populations like ER patients and uh, pediatric patients, um, but in those uh, circumstances where one is trying to um, be most cost effective, whether it's a, a formal member of a, a, an accountable care organization, whether it's a uh, one is part of a, a bundled payment program, or whether one is just concerned about um, the federal government in its MIPS programs, or uh, primary care doctors trying to decide which of their specialists are cost effective or, or, or cost wasting. Um, all of these parties are, have an interest in uh, how able you as an orthopedic surgeon are to get the most information um, for the least money, frankly. So I hope that answers your question. I think you touch upon a, a few important uh, points, uh, one of which uh, is regarding where one might decide to use the volume rad vis-a-vis uh, -vis another modality. I know Dr. Mehta had mentioned this uh, with CT, and I'm going to ask Dr. Mehta to comment a little bit more about when he decides to use volume rad uh, versus other imaging modalities. An imaging modality like CT, when do we decide to use volume rad? Um, you know, it, it, right now it's hard to to say that it's replaced CT for us because CT is so ingrained in the, in the culture of our institution and uh, within our sort of within our division and again with other providers where the CT is already ordered. You know, we get down in, to in the ER to see the distal radius or the pilon or something, and the CT has already been obtained. Uh, and it's it's almost like uh, we didn't we didn't need that. We we could have done it without that. And so a lot of that is education. Right now we're using it in our clinics where we have a little bit more control, obviously, uh, in things like in any issue really where we would traditionally get a CT. Uh, we actually uh, are are have little signs up reminding us that don't forget about getting a tomo or don't initially don't don't not get a tomo. Uh, and so. Um, you know, if, for instance, if I have a patient, you know, with a non-union, uh, I would historically get a CT. I actually get a TOMO first now. I can get the TOMO in my office. I can get the TOMO result back right away, and I can have, and if I'm still not sure what's going on, which is a rarity with TOMO, um, then uh, I will send the patient off for a CT, and then, as Dr. Quinn noted, see him, see him back a week or 10 or 15 days later, and, you know, now you've delayed their care by a couple of weeks when you could have had the answer. So, for us, it's anywhere that we could get a CT or we would be routinely getting a CT in the outpatient setting, we're now getting a TOMO instead, uh, as long as we have the imaging protocol in place for it. So it's really become, um, it's, 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 it's becoming uh, more and more common for us to obtain that. Again, it's also an educational process. I get a new resident every six weeks. Invariably, uh, I'm, I'm talking him, oh, him or her out of getting a CT and, and getting the TOMO. So again, we're introducing this, and so it seems like sometimes we're reinventing the wheel every six weeks. But um, uh, again, once they see the technology, it becomes uh, easier to implement. And uh, I suspect that as we get through uh, a, a few more residents, uh, we'll be, we'll, it'll become almost second nature. 